Hello and welcome to the AB Forums podcast for Wednesday the 15th of April. Uh, joining me on this edition, Steve Withers. All monkey sluts shall be absorbed. Mark Hodgkinson. I say a round earth is a blessing. Each day you can see a new horizon. Good night. Mark Botwright. Light my darkest hour. And Ed Selly. Come sunrise, I'll be so intelligent no cell will be able to hold me. So, the quotes this week were from Heat Vision and Jack. This was something that Ed... Uh, you brought to our attention, you posted the full episode uh, on the forums. Um, just bring people up to speed with exactly what it is. Well, um, to recap, it's the story of Jack Austin, a former astronaut, exposed to, and I quote, inappropriate levels of solar radiation, uh, rendering him the smartest man on Earth, but only in daylight. Um, and he is now in partnership with Heat Vision, uh, which is a motorcycle fused with the mind of his former stoner flatmate. Uh, and they solve mysteries and fight crime. Do we find uh, out how, how it's a former flatmate? Uh, well, he was hit by a ray gun, but it's not clear who fired the ray gun. Maybe that was one of the things that would have been revealed had this magnificent exercise ever fully got off the ground. Uh, so, yes, it's... I tongue firmly in cheek. I, the uh, the the video link is still up in the older podcast item, and we can always stick it in this one again if we need to. Uh, but yes, it's uh, to be honest, it's no worse than a lot of the programs that are seemingly being greenlit in the interim period. So I I take it that you would want to see this go to series and be greenlit. I would certainly like to see it, but you'd need to maintain. I mean, you'd, you'd, there's this is horrible the point I was coming on to. They, Sorry? This is the point I was coming on to. It's fine for a pilot. It's fine for 30 minutes. Joe could wear thin pretty quickly, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, you'd need to you'd need to throw a lot of ideas at the, at the plate, um, and it would live or die on, on, the, on the actors. I mean, obviously, in um, the pilot, Jack Black is Jack Austin, and the motorcycle is voiced by Owen Wilson. That gives him a reasonable sort of thing. Uh, whether... They, oh, I don't, I don't know what sort of state of chemical inconvenience both of those two are in these days, and so whether they'd be able to actually do anything equivalent to this, or whether you'd find someone else to do it. But it would live or die on the people in it, and you'd need some bloody good script writers. Mister Botwright, do you see it being a? Would you see it being a, a, a huge hit? I don't know about huge hit. I think it would obviously be niche, but I, I enjoyed it, and I, I think it could at least run for a series. It kind of reminded me a little bit of um, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Yeah, it was very similar to that. Where it's that nice kind of mix of it's kind of a knowing absurdity and they're laughing, obviously, at these kind of tropes, but it's done in an affectionate, referencing way. Um, so, yeah, I, I could certainly see it, it running for a series. Uh, I suppose it would depend on the casting, like Ed said. And back in 1999, you could have picked up Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson and Jack Black for Tuppence Hapney, but these days might be a bit more expensive. Although, looking at how many big names are now doing TV, who knows? Uh, it, but it would require some very inventive scripts to string it out for a full season. The other um, thing is that you couldn't yeah. over, you couldn't overproduce it. You'd need to keep it firmly schlocky. There's no point bringing Game of Thrones style production values to this. It really no, wouldn't benefit it needs to be at very all. Very lo-fi. Yeah, you know, arguably they should still shoot it in 480 i NTSC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four to three ratio. <laughs> uh, and finally, Hodge, what do you think? Uh, I didn't get very far with it, to be honest. I only got 10 minutes in. It seemed very much of its time. Okay, it was all right, actually. Uh, I just don't think it's, it would work now. Uh, I, I would quite like the idea. Actually, one of the things that could do quite well, mainly as a segment in another, perhaps another comedy format, is um, uh, a famous actor or director railing randomly at George Lucas for five minutes at the start <laughs> of something. I think that, could, that that one could really have legs. Isn't that what the internet's full of? <laughs> People yeah, railing at George give, Lucas. Give it some structure. Uh, and maybe a nice big <laughs> wing-back armchair. That could work really well. Does that actually... Li- why limit it to George Lucas? There's been a fair Lucas? bit of that, Ed, on this podcast, in all fairness. Well, yeah, granted. But, we're, you know, our obstinate refusal to use video means that we can't have... You know, we can't... And also, none, none of us have an Emmy to bang up and down on the on the desk. Unless <laughs> oh, one of you is now going to admit that you have believe, an Emmy. Believe me, it has been raised a number of times that this should be a video podcast... <laughs> I'm sorry, but... <laughs> that would require Phil to put on some trousers. <laughs> if we did it in like a split screen where everyone was a little part of the screen, like the weirdest episode of the Brady Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I actually get undressed to do the podcast. Not fully, but I, I put on comfort pants because I'm sat on the bed. <laughs> if I sit in my jeans, it's very uncomfortable. So I have to get into my lounge pants. The Evie Forum's Ooh, comfort me pants. me my podcasting trousers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> get my podcast hat. I'll tell you what. Before uh, the movies on Friday, there was a trailer for a film called Unfriended. And it seemed, I mean, based upon the trailer at least, it's composed entirely of um, Skype windows and that kind of stuff. I thought, who wants to go to the cinema to see that? I have to look at that every day. <laughs> oh, yes. It sounds like a strange concept for a film. Like a sequel to Phone Booth. Skype call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but even more contained than Phone Booth. But also, I, and I don't know about anybody else, but when I hear the Skype ringtone now, my, it's like a Pavlovian response in me. <laughs> I it immediately think the Phil's ringing me up. <laughs> it gives me a heart attack. I've turned it off. <laughs> my silent now. Is that why you never answer the bloody thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got something to do with it. It's all coming out in the wash now. He just sits there in his podcast pants, ignoring <laughs> us. <laughs> Everyone on mute. You need podcast <laughs> underpants. No, no, they're full pants. They're full we're pants. become Americans. We're, we're, we're going to have to set up a product range, aren't we? You know, the AV Forums podcast in pants. and <laughs> I'm selling money on the back of my model. AV Forums uh, mug. Uh, AV Forums mug, There's plenty uh, of them. That's you. <laughs> the AV Forums I... mug just says, when's 4K coming? <laughs> 4K Blu-ray. Yeah. Chat Why reviews. isn't it OLED? I don't know what to say. He's go. just off on one. He's, he's, uh, he's having a moment. We need to up his dosage. Anyway, I think we've covered Heat Vision and Jack. <laughs> <laughs> covered it more than the original programme did, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I don't think we were go- going back to that one. Uh, but a nice find, Ed. It, it was funny. Um, just a shame it never came to series. Or it probably was a good thing it never came to series. Uh, why are you sending me Dear Colleen? Because, uh, well, I, I've been distracted. I was reading that, you know. What interesting <laughs> problems I have, eh? I had sex with 25 men at a party and now I'm pregnant. What should I do? <laughs> Christ. <laughs> I feel very ashamed. <laughs> yeah. I'm what I worry about what you look at at the internet. Anyway, moving on. Um uh, competition time. So who are we gonna pick on as a victim this week? Um let's go to Mr. Borright. Right, um we've still got the two pairs of Sound Magic P thirty S headphones. Christ, how long has this been running? <laughs> Been going a while. Also, the Coen Brothers uh, Blu-ray box set and Paddington on Blu-ray. Um, we've reviewed that on site, haven't we? Yeah, we don't have to go over it again. All right, fair enough. We've done um, enough. And we've also got the Dali Cubic One stereo system, and that one will end on 30th of April. Okay, so uh, there you go, avforums.com forward slash competitions. Go and win yourself something. Right, we gave them a hard time in March because they were supposed to make an announcement and they didn't. They held on to it till the 9th of April. Uh, but DTS have finally uh, said that DTSX is finally coming, although they gave us some details. They're probably going to need another two launch events to give us the full details. It was heavy on um, buzzwords and uh, and sort of attention-grabbing headlines but actually when you started to read through the press release in detail and and some of the comments they did in q and a's afterwards a lot of it seems to be um left to the, at the discretion of the manufacturers and the studios depending on how much they actually do this what kind of speaking configurations they use how they implement it you know it's 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 on paper it sounds great the idea that you know it's open source and anyone can do it and there's no license fees involved and the system will just will automatically you know um adjust to whatever your speaker layout happens to be and you think oh, well that sounds great that's the ideal solution isn't it but i mean in theory at least what it's saying is you could take this dts mix and you could listen to it on a 2.1 channel system well that's clearly not going to represent what the content creators intended you to do and so without any kind of speaker configuration recommendations at all which i couldn't find any unless you found some i didn't notice phil then i'm still really people are still you know so what does that mean that means you, if you've got an atmos system then it can therefore use atmos layout as well as it could do which is what they're saying is that yeah if you've got atmos you can we can map to that i, I, I think i one, think we can map the, to that. i think the dts uh definition here of vague <laughs> um vague uh the, there wasn't anything cast in stone um, which is why you know I, I said it tongue in cheek that we'll need a launch event, uh, another launch event to launch it again, um, because although there were, like you say, lots of buzzwords and all the rest of it, there wasn't anything really nailed down in terms of the technology. They said didn't matter what kind of speaker setup you had, um, DTS X would manage that and manage to place the objects where they should be in a three D uh, sphere. Um, how? 
they didn't ex- explain how that was going to do. Are, are you going to have a, a little mic like an audio si- um, Odyssey system where it picks up where the speakers are and then determines your layout and then every time there's an effect within a soundtrack, it manages to map that properly? I mean, that sounds really cool if it's able to do that, but I don't think that's what they were saying. <laughs> so not a lot of detail in there. Maybe it's the old cynical me. Maybe it's my old career where I take a lot of the information, disseminate it, and then come up with the fact that this is probably just a spoiler um, to try and spoil Dolby's run with Atmos because at the end of the day, DTS have 97% of the Blu-ray market where they have uh, Master Audio as the main soundtrack on the disc. They don't want to lose that, and they certainly don't want to lose that to Dolby. So is this just uh, their play at uh, spoiling Atmos? That's the cynical side There's of me. There's no it's question exactly that that's partly what they're doing. I mean, that was one of the reasons why they made an announcement in December or the end of November that they were going to make an announcement in March so that you know people are immediately, there's some doubt there for people who are thinking of buying an AV receiver. Um, DTS, until this announcement, that was one of the big surprises when they announced that they were actually getting back into the cinema business again because obviously they sold that arm of the business to Datasat. How many years ago was that? Four or five years ago? It was probably five years ago now. I, I'm guessing it's a five-year um, clause in the contract where they couldn't do anything yeah. in the cinema yeah. environment and now that's just run out. And maybe that's the reason why we waited till March, April before the announcement because they couldn't, they had to wait for that, um, that I think, clause I think to run we, out on their We've got to be careful payment. here, Steve, and say that, no, that this is all speculation, I'm not yeah, speculation on our part. We, we but, know none of this. But it, I would be very surprised if DTS bought, uh, sorry, if D- Datasat bought DTS's cinema arm without some kind of clause restricting them from doing anything in the cinema business for a certain number of years. And I'm pretty sure that would be the case. I mean, you'd be mad to do anything other than that. The reason they're doing that, obviously, again, is to is to try and Dolby's, you know, ambitions in terms of, A, having some kind of um, immersive sound format for the professional home cinema market, and B, having having a, 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 um, a domestic version of that, and the idea of having this sort of one workflow that goes down from the original mix, Atmos mix, and then bounces down to whatever it's going to be out below that. I mean, they've been talking about doing something quite similar, which is the, you know, that the processor would map according to what you've got to give you the full Atmos experience. So obviously DTS are following a similar approach that they're saying that we can do um, cinema mixes and you can do, you know, one mix fits all. And, and, and you know, the idea of making it easier and cheaper for, for uh, studios to produce soundtracks. The interesting thing is you talk about Blu-ray, 97% of the Blu-rays being DTS, H, my HD Master Audio soundtracks. Does that really matter? Is Blu-ray a big market? I mean, I think Dolby's still the predominant I, I um, don't know. If you had delivery system elsewhere, isn't it? If, if you had 97% of any market, you'd want to hang on to that. Yeah, you want to, but is Dolby still, I think, is the dominant sound format for everything else, pretty much? Well, they, they are in the cinema. They've just launched their Dolby Cinema thing as well, where you know the whole thing is that they redesign... Um, certain screens and theatres and stuff. I, I I think there's an American chain has just signed a deal with them to do that. So you get Dolby Vision, you get Dolby Atmos, you have this uh, wraparound display at the front door of the theatre as you go in and all the rest of it. I mean, they're really trying to sell that side, the digital cinema package side of things um, with their vision and, and Atmos and all the rest of it. Uh, that's something that DTS have been caught cold on because they're not in the theatre market anymore. Like you say, they sold that to Datasat. Um, so they only have the, the home formats to work with at the moment. So um, they have to make a move um, one way or another to protect the business that they do have from Dolby. But that's, that's my point, though. You talk about home formats. Well, are we talking streaming? Is streaming using DTS or is it using Dolby? As far as I'm aware, it's predominantly Dolby. And that's the future, right? It's not Blu-ray. Blu-ray is no, not dead, but it's certainly dying. Hang on. Did I just um, hear Mr. Withers say See We've that. beaten him. Yay. Yay. Well, no, if you look, look just last <laughs> week, Fox um, were talking about doing a DVD release of The Simpsons, but they weren't talking about doing a Blu-ray release. They're not doing the, it. The digital HD, yeah. The digital HD um, release of Star Wars, which was on Friday. Um, is it, yeah, it was Friday, wasn't it? Um, you know, that was digital download. There's, yeah. it, there's no question, absolutely no question, the studios have got no interest in continuing with the disc-based format. Absolutely none. So we might get 4K Blu-ray, but it, I'll be massively surprised if we get much studio support for it. Don't think they've got any interest at all. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reality. I don't like it any more than anybody else does, but we have to accept the fact that Blu-ray and disc format days are numbered. So, so that's what I mean by, is it really, does it really matter who's the dominant for, um, for sound format on a Blu-ray? What matters is who's the dominant sound format 
out there in streaming download world. And, and at the moment, as far as I'm aware, it's Dolby. Okay, uh, Ed, you sit out of this little bubble that we're all in called home cinema a little bit. Uh, you dabble now and again, so I've heard. Um, now and again, like I've got an Atmos system <laughs> at the moment. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you're saying. I Don't get me wrong. I, I appreciate that the arguments for films on physical media are different to music on physical media. There are very few limitations now to securing music in any co- any quality form you like in streamed or downloaded format and furthermore because the file sizes are that deal smaller than video uh it isn't anything like as critically reliant on having a big internet line a quick internet line than, than it is with film but I just I, the thing is that you you're you, you know you're you're doing it's, it's a King Canute sort of moment to think that 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 you, there is enough enough interest in full fat every you know every nuance of picture every nuance of sound to 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 maintain much of an interest in in physical media so really you'd be better off you know I'm sure I'll, I'll get a little bit of disagreement on this you'd be better off if you have a long term quality interest in av into getting into streaming and be- and start becoming the noisy minority that continuously wants to push the envelope of what streaming is capable of because in the fullness of time it's capable of delivering everything that 4k blu-ray can and probably more you've just got to keep asking for it from from the very outset is it a spoiling tactic uh, reading between the lines is this what they're playing or do you think they're playing the long game here or do you think it just doesn't no matter I well in the great in the great scheme of things I don't think it matters, um, but that's because it, you know let's face it this is a market now dominated by uh, sound bars and sound projectors and other single point false around items. Now, notionally, if DTS had put more effort into making their height system a better ghost effect than than somebody well, else, well, this is what they're all power, all power to them, but. It's it's yeah. It fundamentally it is. It's not it's not relevant. If it's a long game, where they really are thinking about something that can be delivered as part of um, stream content or perhaps something that can be licensed to TV studios as well. I don't know. Um, but at the moment, it just looks like a, we you know we have got something. Um, you know, just just think about us and and leave it there. When I visited Netflix last year, they were mentioning Atmos as being the next big thing in streaming audio. Is it there yet, Atmos? I know it's coming to 4K Netflix. I'm not sure if it's available yet. But they can deliver Atmos through Double Digital Plus, so it's certainly conceivable that they could deliver it um, with Netflix or whoever else wants to get on board. Oh, it's coming, it's coming to Netflix, definitely. For, for oh, sure. definitely, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's coming. Both, both you guys have mentioned, both Ed and Phil have mentioned valid points, which is, you know, at the end of the day, our, our, our um, Dolby, and there is probably more to this than just arguing about who gets to be the dominant player in terms of an immersive audio system on Blu-ray, because immersive audio systems themselves aren't going to be that popular just because of the practicality of putting speakers in the ceiling or even height speakers into a room where well, you the see, audience have is... trouble trying to fit five speakers in, never mind ten. Well, this is where DTS's argument started to make a lot of sense. But then you got to think, well, maybe this, they were making this argument because they knew it was going to make a lot of sense. And that was that, according to them, DTSX will work on any audio system with uh, yeah. any number of channels, as long as it's two or more. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's all well and good to say that, but we'll have to wait till we actually get some chance to test this to see whether it can deliver some kind of immersive experience. Because ultimately, what it's going to be using is using phantom speakers, right? Isn't it? It's going to be you can you can only do so much before we're into the realms of just science fiction here. Um, but I think what they did that was clever was um, was you know suggesting that it, well, certainly clever slash disingenuous, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> um, not specifying a specific um, speaker layout means that um, you know, we were talking about before, we? only last week. <laughs> well, we were saying last week, if, we, if they had any sense, they would pick something that could be used for Atmos or for Oro. And that's kind of what they're saying. You could use it with either configuration, it would still work. So that makes it easier because we're not talking about sort of that, a head on a head that, format. Was the, war. that was the big collect $200, get out of jail card that they played there. Mm. And there was so, there was no specific information whatsoever. Um, it's interesting that 70 are um, trying to head off some sort of you know, format war and agree a single standard for uh, immersive audio, which would be good. 
um, that would be quite sensible for you know not the sen- not being sensible is, is very common activity in the consumer insurance industry but um well it, i mean to me it, it looks like and you know ed's already mentioned it they're they're fighting over such a small market such a niche niche market i mean saying that you look at the figures that we've had on our story there that's been on the home page you know it's had over nearly five thousand views uh 220 odd comments which yeah but two and a half thousand of those views were steve <laughs> <laughs> so so obviously there is an interest there but then this is on av forums where that is the main interest the main interest is home cinema and audio and, and visual and all the rest of it um is this is this going to break anywhere else is it going to be interesting to anybody else if you move away from the main core of av enthusiasts who are you selling it to none zip zilch nada in so much as if we're talking about its ab- its ability to work as a convenience feature, it is so far down the list compared to a number of other convenience features that it's just it's a line on a spec sheet, nothing more. I think looking in for the DTSX announcement, it's just made it more confusing. If anything, it's, it, we were kind of hoping we'd know where we were exactly with 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 all three, um, but it's just made it a bit a little bit more vague and uninteresting to me. It, although it pains me because. Um, Personally, I like the guy who invented it, and I also like the technology, which is all 3D. I think we can discount them at this point. Yeah, I think it's pretty safe to discount them um, because there has been no movie releases on Blu-ray, as far as I'm aware, and there's nothing in the pipeline. So as far no. as for the home, I think we can discount them from, from the home cinema side of things. So all you've got is Atmos at the minute, where you do have the technology on AVRs, you do have the discs, they have the head start, and then we have DTSX, which, like we say, we're still confused about. So... Who do you put your money on in such a small market? Well, I think you got to go with Atmos, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, there's an established uh, base of receivers, some of which were older receivers that could be upgraded to Atmos, which I think was a big deal for people who did spend a lot of money on a receiver, you know, two years ago, for example. I had two discs arrive on Saturday that, you know, have Atmos soundtracks, Gravity and Unbroken. So there are movies out there. I think there's eight so far, not a ton, not a lot of movies, I grant you, but there's 200, over 200 Atmos um soundtrack movies you know historic ones that have been created so there's that there is a catalogue of films they can draw on clearly at the moment there is no dtsx cinema films obviously that will be that might change based upon their announcement but currently there are none Uh, i know they said there there are 10 studios currently you know um assessing this the format and deciding what to do i'm sure they're doing exactly the same thing with atmos as well um the, the announcement was long on hype and short on detail um the only sort of good news for anybody who's interested in, in DTSX and if you've got the Denon X7200 is that will be upgradable, um, making it about the only receiver currently that is upgradable to DTSX. And anybody else is going to have to buy a new one, basically. Um, plus a couple of the high-end receivers, um, sorry, not receivers, high-end processors like... Um, like um, what's Datasat. It called? Well, Datasat, yes, and also um, Trinov. Trinov, yeah. Yeah, trin off. So there's some some of the high end stuff can be upgraded, and the X7 200 can be upgraded, which is I guess good news for Denon. Um, but um, otherwise, you're going to be buying new new kit if you want X. So it's going to depend really on on what kind of support it gets from the studios. Uh, in terms of giving people some useful consumer advice uh, on the podcast, which would be a first. Um, <laughs> if you want these extra formats, I guess the advice is wait till next year's models are available. If you're not interested in immersive audio, um, there are, are tons of great AVRs out there that don't cost a hell of a lot of money and perform really well. Don't sit on the fence if you're not interested in immersive audio. If you are, wait to next year's models would be the advice. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you could or, just plow on with your Atmos setup now, couldn't you, I guess, knowing that it will work with DTSX. Although you will need the AVR, of course. So, yes. Yeah, don't confuse things, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> well, you could get your speakers up in, red, in readiness. Or buy an X7200 because that will do all three formats. I've got some lovely NAD stuff turning up. M17, M27? Yeah. They're lovely. Splendid, splendid things. As I say, um, if we, we, took, we, we have in the past mentioned knob feel. Um, <laughs> the volume control on that M17 is a work of art. Just uh, absolutely just the most tactile thing i'm i'm sort of unable to put words together properly. it's really really good really really good uh but anyway it's turning up tomorrow so if it yeah i'll see a nice and knob feels it's great it's really good um 
other upcoming reviews uh, what do we have coming up? We've got some Yamaha stuff, um, Yamaha soundbar stuff, I've got to say, from the company that more or less invented that sector of the market. I've had one running in now. It didn't sound that great when I first set it up. It sounded pretty boxy, but it was a brand new unit out of the box. It's been running for a day now and it's starting to sound really quite lovely uh, for what it is. I got the YSP 1400 from Yamaha. Again, um, you know, one of their sound bars. Um, I haven't actually set it up yet, so I can't comment on sound quality, but I do know from experience that the YSP range, which uses um, sound projection, which is what the SP stands for in the sort of the, the prefix, is um, uh, is very effective at creating a sense of immersion. Obviously, you can't, you know, the only speakers behind you, you can't, if you play, um, you know, a 5.1 test tones, you aren't going to get a sound coming from behind you, but it can create a sense of sounds coming from behind you by bouncing them off the walls. So it's uh, quite an interesting technology. AVR-wise, uh, what we've got, well, I've already said uh, that I've got processor power amp turning turn, turn up from uh, NAD. Also got the Yamaha A1040. Uh, Ed, you've looked at the, was it the 3040? 3040, yeah. Um, so this is a couple of runs down the ladder, but I've got to say, when I unboxed it, and there is a video coming, um, really nice. It's the titanium and black finish, and uh, really impressed with the build quality. Uh, and it's a thousand pounds, is that right? It's around about the thousand pound mark for this thing. So um, really nice receiver. So the review will be coming up from that soon. Uh, AVR wise, you got anything, Steve? I only what I mentioned last week, which was the AVR 750 for Mark Am. Um, nothing else currently on the way. Uh, Ed, what you got coming up? Uh, same things I mentioned last week, as, as as is often joked and often derided for, I tend to deliver the next clutch of things in a block at the end of the month, sometimes minutes before the end of the month. Sometimes um, well over the anyway. end of the month. <laughs> oh, God, I work with fools. Um, so, yes, uh, there'll be some uh, funky in-ear earphone action uh, of a record player that looks quite unlike any other. Uh, hopefully some uh, cost-effective speaker package action. Uh, interesting counterpoint to the Acoustic Energy 100 series review, which just went up at the time of writing yesterday. It went up on Sunday, so it'll still be somewhere near the front page when this podcast uh, goes out. Uh, so very similar pricing point for that. And the fourth one, uh, it'll be something. It'll be something amazing. Trust me. Okay. Hodge, what you got? Uh, this week, or podcast week, will be the Samsung 48-inch JS9000. Are you back as being Mr. Samson now? I am indeed, yes. Because <laughs> yes. following that, we will have the Well, Samsung. he says that, but me and Steve have both got Samsungs. We managed to prize the... the... You're all I'm, reclaim, I'm reclaiming my territory now. I, I've got a Samsung uh, J6500 Blu-ray player. And uh, Mr. Buttright, you doing anything? <laughs> yes, and I resent the implication. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never sure. You never tell me anything. Uh, I've I've just finished um, Tower of Guns on the PlayStation 4. That review should be up by the time this podcast goes out, hopefully. Let me guess, that's a puzzle-solving game, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, Leon should also have the code for um, Infinity Runner. Um, there's been a little bit of a delay with that due to a, a kind of confusion over the Peggy rating, but that should hopefully be coming soon. And he'll also be looking at uh, Mortal Kombat X. Okay, thanks very much. So that's uh, the reviews coming up for the rest of the month. Right, I happen to be in a large retailer at the weekend looking at different bits and pieces, and I ended up next to the Lady Shavers, and I had to stand... <laughs> Not by accident, I'm guessing. <laughs> I had to stand there to hear the conversation which was going on, which was an absolute belter. Now, if we all remind ourselves of uh, classic myths, which actually turn out to be classic truths, um, of salesmen in large electrical retailers telling people at the time of plasma where they had to uh, refill them with gas and other <laughs> other brilliant sales techniques. Well, this one was uh, was about OLED. <laughs> sitting next to a Samsung curved LED TV and an LG curved OLED TV. And the sales guy said to this couple, yeah, well, if it was me, I'd go for the Samsung because, you know, the LG, it's it's an organic. That's what the O stands for. He says, it's organic and it means it'll die. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it obviously... It, what was his words? It lives in the substrate of the of the back of the TV and we don't know how long it's going to live for. So I would go... <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, there's a logic there somewhere. <laughs> you know. Substrate of the back of the TV. <laughs> like it's yeah. populated with those little fish that, you know, you add water to them. 
<laughs> I can't wait to get one of them in for review. I can check out a whole new planet on the back of my well, it's, it's It's a living organism. <laughs> Do you have to feed it? <laughs> it drinks. Jesus Christ. Well, they're all going to die one day, aren't they? But God. Yeah, everything's got a finite lifespan, for God's sake. It's made of metal, so it'll rust. Eventually, the sun will expand and engulf the earth in about three billion years, and we're all buggered. But uh, until then, the most depressed salesman ever. <laughs> What's the point? Everything It'll all ends. die in the end. <laughs> but I guess the serious point that we're trying to make here is: don't listen to salesmen and large electrical retailers. And a lot of the time, it's not their fault. I'm going to stick up for them a little bit here. Now, we in the past did some secret shopper stuff, which we never got round to publishing because it was. It, it would go too much one way rather than trying to be balanced about this. But, Ed, you've worked on the other side of the uh-huh. curtain here in, in retail and, and you've also worked um, in the promotional side of things and all the rest of it. And for a company, this has to be the biggest issue, which is the lack of proper training, especially in large electrical retailers where the turnover of staff is massive. Yeah, I mean, you could, it wants, it, with the turnover of staff in a lot of the major chains... The simple truth of the matter is that beyond crib sheets um, and uh, you know other incentivizers, you just there's there isn't really any point throwing in a huge amount of training resource at people because it's not really going to affect their decision to stay in any meaningful sense. Uh, even if commission is involved, it, it's not something that people want to do indefinitely. So there are limits to the amount of training it's practical to actually apply. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I have to stress, I've never, you know, the largest sort of retailer I've ever, ever worked for was Richard Sounds. So that was still five of us in a, in a shop that was incredibly small. Uh, uh, so although we, we did a little bit of, um, you know, specialising in certain categories, you sort of just had to be able to do anything that was on the shop floor, but that was still a fairly narrow clutch of products. If you look at the allocated area that people will be responsible for in a larger retailer where they also sell exciting things like lady shaves and things like that, the, the real chance of having specific product knowledge in any specific category... The Venn diagram, the overlap there between yeah. selling OLEDs and lady shaves. Yeah, uh, and, and I've got, and I've got to say, say it, was, it, it was quite an impressive lineup of lady shavers. I've got to say, I, it's probably where the money is over the televisions. But yeah, it's it's a case of you know I I like to think that you know I have reasonable product knowledge in a number of categories. But for the love of all things holy, don't ask me about televisions. I I do know that organic LEDs are not grown, so I I am <laughs> and, and they're not what, living. Yeah, they're not living. It's not not you know you it's, your 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 LG television is not some terrifying biomechanical <laughs> hybrid that may or may not become sentient or just yeah. die at some point. But equally, I don't know. You know, it's not my speciality subject. In the same way that Phil, you probably don't want to talk. You know, you don't want to be asked too many questions by by friends and family if they wanted to buy a phono stage. It's you know, no, I, I you, could I could answer that, but you know what they do, and I dare bored. say you could make some baseline recommendations in the same way that I can make some baseline television recommendations. But drilling down through specs and into you know what they actually are capable of, and what they're promising, it's you know it it's not easy. It's a, it's they a, also it's have a, to learn to distill everything down, though, don't they? Yes, because yeah. you've got someone's thing. attention for a few minutes. It's someone who might not know anything about it, so you have to find some way of getting some kind of information across them in the shortest possible time, in the simplest way. And so, well, I think that's where it often kind of gets garbled. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm, I, I want to be fair to people who work in these large electrical retailers. It's not an easy job. I wouldn't want to do it. You're not given the right training and all the rest of it. But there are some absolute classic lines that come out, and you're right. It's because They've only got a few minutes to impress on on the customer there, and they're always going to push as well. If it's against two products, they're all going to push to the one that they get the most commission on. <laughs> any sale, any good salesman's going to do that. the The problem is, Steve. I, I mean, I can think back ten years ago, and round about me, there was about six independent AV retailers. They were all really good at their job. Uh, they all had the latest kit in. Some of them specialised in projectors. Some of them specialised in sound systems. Some of them specialised in hi-fi. None of them exist anymore. There's a real problem in getting good information and getting good demos of products. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, these days it's it's not impossible, but it's incredibly hard. To, I mean, we always say, you know, if possible, demo something before you spend large sum of money on it. But the problem is these days it's difficult to find anywhere to demo it. Uh, and that's because of the, the internet. You know, if you if you run a a small um, AV store and you have a demo facility, you know, that's expensive. You've got to build it. You've got to kit it out. Um, people come in. They demo it and then they go and buy it online somewhere else, and it, and it's, it's you know it's heartbreaking, but that's that's the nature of the world we live in now, and it means unfortunately there are fewer and fewer places where you can demo uh, AV equipment. Um, you know, I'm thinking particularly of things like projectors uh, and AV receivers and high end systems. I mean, it's becoming harder and harder, and and you know if you're spending and you could be spending five grand on a projector and never actually haven't seen it in action. That's kind of crazy, really. Um, for one thing, you know, you want to make sure you don't have suffer from things like um, uh, rain, rain, no, rainbow artifacts on, on DLPs. You, know, you need to make sure that that's not something that's going to bother you or anyone else in your family before you should spend money on DLP. Luckily, most DLP projectors are quite cheap, but there are some expensive ones. Um, and then there are other, you know, just, you know, whether you want it for gaming or for, um, for watching movies, you know, watching it in, in a brighter room or a darker room. You know, these kind of things you can establish by talking to an expert and getting a demo. Whereas um, unless you read someone like AV Forums, you know, when you go online, then you're talking about really buying things on trust. Well, maybe it's because the general public want, uh, you know, the cheapest item possible and, and it's them that's forcing everybody to the bottom end of the market and that's why there's no time for training and stuff. But they're not getting a very good service out there. No, but I, I'm, I'm afraid, um, and I may or may not receive some criticism for this, you get the uh, you get what you you deserve I, I read the efforts that people will go to to save single or double digits amounts of money and then the same people heaven forfend if the product goes wrong then expressing some disappointment that you know if it's an online if it's a small online retailer that no one's really ever heard of their ability to immediately resolve any problem that you might have is somewhere between slim and none if you want everything at the lowest denominational price point, you have to accept that you're going to have to sacrifice a large number of other aspects to, to get there. You can you go for it and feel free to, um, but there is and there remains an argument for you know possibly paying for a little bit more in the way of backup and infrastructure. It's why I buy a lot of white goods from John Lewis, to be honest. Um, I you know i accept that you know and, and i know that they've notionally got this price per, uh, price promise thing but it's 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 a, a hoop jumping ex exercise at best if it's a relatively um you know a relatively meaningless amount of money different i know that in the event of me having a problem john lewis will sort it out whether whereas you know unknown white goods online.com may or may not actually still exist yeah. or be completely useless yeah like, but, like, like i said we used to have the independents around here and i knew all of them by name and nine times out of ten i would go in just for a quick chat quick look at the the latest kit and stuff i mean we're going back 10 15 years ago now um latest kit that kind of thing and they knew that every, every once in a while probably once a year i'd go and drop a, a, a fair amount of money and i'd do that because a they've been friendly uh b the the they gave me their time of day, even though they know that nine times out of ten they weren't going to get a sale. But then there was also the after sales, and I didn't mind paying an extra hundred quid because of the service I was getting. Yeah, I did the same with my last TV. I bought a long time ago now. But it was a Panasonic, local Panasonic dealer. I paid, I think, about a hundred pounds more for it. Uh, and something did go wrong, and then I got a really great service, and then I got a replacement TV. And and they've gone bump now. And like you, Philip, well, there was five or six around here, and there's there's nothing now. I have to go out of town to go to the you know, to the big um, retail park to to a certain retailer if, if I want to go and look at a TV out of the home. So it's it, so it, we try and give that advice where you know support your local independent, but there's hardly any left. I mean, you must have said the two channel dealers. I mean, the news is rather better in this rather more niche area. Um, so uh, there's been a die off of dealers that perhaps weren't as good as they thought they were, but true specialists have done uh, a very commendable job at showing a world beyond just buying everything online. Uh, and um, the only unfortunate problem is that the rate of obsolescence for AV gear means that it's just not practical for them to do much in the way of AV. Um, it, you know, the, the, the risks of finding yourself holding on to stock, which is now worth buttons, 
and you can't offer proper trade ins and all the other problems. Unfortunately, AV is is in a is in a in a very very difficult place uh, for, for 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 continued support from people like from people like that. Right. Okay. I mean, is is there a solution? This, I think we we need to wrap this one up quickly. Is there a solution? How do you buy your kit, dear listener? Uh, what do you do? Do you go to the specialist? Do you hunt out uh, independents? Do you go and demo stuff at them and then go and buy it online? Um, or do you stick with with uh, a retailer? knowing that you're going to get after service and so on. And how difficult is it for you to go out and demo the kit? Just demoing the kit that, that we review here at AV Forums. Is it easy to go and see the latest Samsung TVs or Sony or Panasonic or any of these other brands and actually see the stuff that we're reviewing here? How difficult is it for you? Put your comments in the bottom of the podcast. And next is what I think will be a very short Games News. <laughs> Okay, uh, time for games news, and it's uh, like I say, it's going to be a short one because the games podcast is coming up this week. Yes, uh, Steve's been a bit ill, unfortunately, so we're going to be recording that one tonight. Obviously, last month we we published, and then straight away, Nintendo, obviously just to spite us, came out with lots of news about new console and making mobile games. So that will be a big topic. Uh, as are, well. are, you, are you suggesting that head office at Nintendo sit and wait for the games podcast and then think, right, they've published, let's go? I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, other than that, we've got uh, Kojima and Konami, their little fight. Um, PlayStation Home has finally shut down. Yeah. Um, on, <laughs> yes. Sorry. I was yes, there on the, opening night. I was there on opening night. I never went back. Dreadful. I think we all were. Yeah. The world's smallest violin plays for them. Um, on live as well, shutting down. And interestingly, uh, Sony have bought up a bunch of their patents, which is... Uh, people are saying is is with one eye on their PlayStation Now streaming service. Um, Amazon spending big on Crytek's CryEngine, and obviously plug in the latest games reviews. Okay, so that's a games podcast. It's not recorded yet, but it, will, it be. will be. It will be by the time uh, you listen to this, and uh, hopefully it will be up as well because it's supposed to go up before this one. But if Steve's been ill. It might be a few days late. Is that what you're saying, Mark? I'm I'm saying prepare yourself. You know, <laughs> quality takes time. And the games podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And is that games news? I think that is. Oh, and there's been an Xbox One price cut. Hooray! Let's move on to movie news. And uh, the familiar question is what's at the cinema, Steve? This weekend, Phil, I saw John Wick, which is the new action film starring Keanu Reeves. Uh, not possibly the greatest title of all time, John Wick. It sounds like some sort it, of rhyming slang. It sounds but, like something uh, from Viz's Profanosaurus, actually. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It does. You're thinking, like, what well, that means? Terrible trouble uh, with my John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really, really good movie. Really enjoyable action film. It's um, The premise is quite straightforward. It's you know, good old-fashioned revenge. Keanu Reeves' character, John Wick, is a uh, is an assassin, a hired, you know, hitman who's um, basically given up the business, retired, got married. Um, his wife sadly dies of cancer and um, she leaves him as a parting gift, a puppy. And then um, um, something unfortunate happens to his prize car and his puppy. And he then goes on a rampage and kills absolutely everybody involved. Um, basically a bunch of Russian gangsters. And the film is essentially after that, you know, after the initial sort of 10 minute setup is, is a series of, of, of action sequences, but they're all really well done. Nicely thought out beautifully shot and choreographed uh, and um, yeah I find it really exciting and enjoyable and it's nice seeing kind of Reeves in the role you know he's, he's, it's been a bit up and down over the last few years although he's done some interesting stuff um, he's very good at playing the sort of you know the, the um, quiet not too chatty action types and um, this is exactly what this is and uh, and, and I thought it was a, a really good movie um, I, I know it's I think Cass gave it 10 out of 10. I wouldn't say it was a 10 out of 10 but um, certainly it's it's uh, an 8 out of 10 a great action film um, I think it's done very well, so they're looking at doing a, a sequel, um, John Wick 2, presumably. Um, Does he have to get that, another that, dog for that one? Yeah, yeah, buy another dog. <laughs> John Wick 2, the dog's return. But yeah, no, it's uh, it's, it's it's one of those, I mean, it, what I like about the action sequences are it doesn't resort to shaky cam and fast editing in order to convey action. They're all nicely choreographed, steady cameras, really good action sequences that you used to see all the time and now quite rarely see, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a cracking movie. Um, great fun. Um, some funny lines. An interesting kind of... It lives within this strange world where all these you know, villains and hitmen live. And there's a hotel called, I think it's the 
the Continental, and, and basically, if you st- hitmen stay there, and when you're in the hotel, you're not allowed to kill anybody else. It's against hotel rules, and if you do, the consequences can be dire. Um, so it's it's kind of it lives in this sort of strange world. It lays out all of its ground rules and, and sticks to them, which is great. And uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a great movie. It has some interesting little um, cameos in there some, from um, some well-known actors, and uh, yeah, it was a great good film, very enjoyable. I highly recommend it. So, sorry, Steve, I must have missed your score. What was your score on this? Eight out of ten. Mm, so quite a difference to what Kaz said. Yeah, but Kaz also gave the Interstellar a 10 out of 10. And there's no way that's a 10 out of 10. That's a 5 out of 10 at best. I actually watched the film it wanted to be last night, 2001 Space Odyssey, and that is so much better. All right, so what else is uh, opening this Friday, Steve, quickly? This Friday we have a film called Child 44, starring Tom Hardy and... Um, uh, Gary Oldman, that's it, it's Gary Oldman. Um, based upon a series of novels uh, set in Soviet Russia, it's basically a police investigation into um, a series of killings. It's a very good novel. I've, I, I, Is it? I, it's a book I've read and everything. That was before I had, I had a child. Um, I'm, I have to say I have quite high expectations for that um, in so much as there's nothing intrinsically difficult to film about the book and neither should it. You know, neither do you, would you have to hack huge amounts of it out. The 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 the, pro, the arc is in itself manageable. There's nothing crazy that happens. It should, if they've played the novel due service, it should be a good film. The only problem I can see with the film is um, it's got it does that terrible thing. Everyone's putting on a Russian accent. It's like why don't they just speak with their normal accents? Uh, because it's just it's too much like a low a low after a bit, isn't it? When people start because then when they do that, you get fortitude and you people going. What nationality are you actually supposed to be? <laughs> so, yeah, not easy. Uh, anyway, that's Child 44, which Kaz will be reviewing. And then we've also got A Little Chaos, film directed by Alan Rittman, um, starring Kate Winslet, where she's uh, basically a, a, um, a landscape gardener, and she ends up getting involved in doing the gardens for Versailles, I believe, uh, and falling in love. And the other film is The Last Five Years, which is a romantic drama. So... Probably of those three, I think our, mem- our membership probably more likely to go and see Child 44. Okay, and uh, as I'm now back buying Blu-rays again, uh, is there anything worth buying next week? There's two films out, Black Sea, which is a, a thriller set in a submarine with Jude Law. Um, have not seen it, but it looks quite interesting. Um, I think he got a bit of stick for doing a Scottish accent in that one, <laughs> but sounded all right to me, although obviously I'm not Scottish. So I think I'll be the be judge more, of that. You might be more attuned to it than me, yeah, Phil. The other film um, that's coming out, um, actually, sorry, that's this week. Black Sea's this week along with Night at the Museum 3. They're out this week. Next week is The Hobbit Battle of the Five Armies, which, um, well, if you're a Hobbit fan or you want to see how it ended up, um, you might want to get that. I'll I'll wait for Netflix. Great picture and sound, I've got to say. I've I've already got it, and it's got really good picture and sound. (laughs) The other film going next week, um, which is a bit more of a treat, um, the first Blu-ray release in this country, or pretty much anywhere, I think, uh, of Midnight Run, which is one of my favourite films. Cool. So um, worth getting if you are a fan of The Run, and I am. Uh, right, so let's go back to John Wick and the, the lead man in that, Keanu Reeves. Um, got to say, he gets a lot of stick, old Keanu, but I, I've read a few things now, I've seen a few things, I've, I've watched some documentary uh, that he made as well, and he comes across as a really nice guy uh, on the other side of the camera, and I believe he, he, he gives a shed load of money to charity, he does a lot of good work in the community and stuff, and he doesn't... He's not the type of person to live in a big flash mansion or drive flashy cars and that kind of thing. So, uh, seems like a nice guy off the screen. Gets a lot of stick sometimes for some of the characters that he plays on screen. So, what were our favourite Keanu Reeves movies? And let's go to Mr. Botwright first. Um, it's got to be Point Break. <laughs> yes. I think it's it's the only kind of absolute classic. It's, it's just that one bit where... He can't shoot him in the back, so he, so he turns his gun up into the air and he, <laughs> and he just, uh, you know, empties... Unloads his entire clip. Empties the clip into the air. Best bit of acting I've ever seen, that. Uh, I, I don't think I'd agree that it's the best bit of acting I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it was it was a big, dumb roller coaster of a film, and I think that's what works best with him. I think we saw that as well with uh, the original Matrix. Uh, it kind of... I don't know, disappeared up his own backside a little bit, but as long as you can kind of skip past the moments where he's trying to earnestly act and just kind of get into the flow of the of the action, then yeah, I, I, he's he's a he's a passable actor. He, he certainly seems to do better when he's not speaking a lot of the time, but I don't think that's necessarily you know just a kind of criticism of him. I've always felt the same about say someone like Kevin Costner 
which is you know when he he has to play like a kind of wooden plank then he does it very very well <laughs> A wooden plank who yeah. spent two hundred million dollars on, I, I, on the scenery to make to make his plank look, look you know, slightly yeah. better. I've got to say, um, Patrick Swayze in that as well is pretty good. His body, yes. Well, now this gets me onto what I was, if and when I was, in so much as great Keanu Reeves films do rely on someone else giving it full acting chops as well. I hope you're not going to see Sandra Bullock in, in Speed. No, but I was going to say Dennis Hopper. Ah, I thought you were going to say the bus in Speed. Well, the, the, obviously, the gra- the it was more bus, animated. The Greyhound bus is a design classic. You're not going to get any criticism from me. But Dennis Hopper is it, you. You in so much as I think actually Reeves gets a lot of stick for 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 his acting. It's more the case he's not a, he's not and never has been particularly demonstrative. So you need someone going bananas. For it for the film to work correctly, and so that's when you get, um, uh, you know, Dennis Hopper in, in, in that instance. You've got, I have to say, one of the other ones I, I, I do rather like more out of more out of the way it looks than actually anything else. Again, in Constantine, there's other, there's just crazy other people all around Reeves, and that that sort of makes it sort of work. Re- relatively well that and the fact he's got an absolutely monstrous score Constantine much underrated I think he's been a bit typecast by his, uh, his was it Bill and Ted was that his first movie he, he kind of got this, voice. this dumb it. stoner p- sort of personality uh, I don't did, know if that's what he's I, like in real life did I read that they're going to bring Bill and Ted back well with with the original Bill and Ted or, yes or... yes <laughs> well, it was I quite, I quite liked things. it at the time I don't, I'm not sure whether, I don't know if I'd like it now I think they've aged quite well Oh no, God, Keon, if he's aged incredibly well. No, well, I'm talking about Bill and Ted here. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> but Keanu has yeah, aged very well. Yeah, he's said for someone who's now 50, 51, isn't he? Yeah. Fifty-one. Bloody he's, hell, yeah. I was slightly concerned that Speed was twenty-one years ago. It's like, yeah, God, no. it's like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, pop quiz. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I said I liked Bill and Ted at the time. I, I can't say I'm a, a massive Keanu fan. Um, Point Break has been mentioned, and and The Matrix. I think that's the only ones I can actually remember him being in. But I enjoyed all those. Good. All right, Steve. On you go. Like you, Phil. I've never heard a bad word said about Keanu Reeves. Uh, he looks like he seems to be a genuinely nice bloke, um, which is always nice to know when, about someone you, you kind of like. Um, so interestingly, I've always liked him in The Gift, where he's playing a really nasty bit of work, which is kind of against type for him. Um, apart from the ones we've already mentioned. As I mentioned, uh, I think when I was doing the John Wick review, and John Wick's worth checking out, by the way, Dan, Man of Tai Chi, which he also directed, is is, is quite good. He plays a villain in that, which is, again, is a bit unusual for Keanu. Um, one of my favourite Keanu Reeves films is his when he teamed up again with Sandra Bullock for The Lake House, um, which is one of those kind of romantic, not really comedies, romantic dramas with time travel. And the time travel element is just thrown in there. There's no explanation whatsoever for why there's any kind of crossover and that because basically they both live in the same house in different time zones and they can, can communicate with one another through the letterbox <laughs> did they meet up with so great do they what did they meet up with so crates <laughs> no he didn't meet up with so crates no so um but it, it was uh it was quite a sweet film and um you know even though for the majority of the film obviously because they're in different time zones and not i don't mean as in different parts of the world i mean as in different times entirely and um, they obviously can't meet up um it's, it's still a really sweet film and I really like it but it's quite, definitely not what you class as a typical um, typical uh, Keanu Reeves movie um, you know, tend to think more of the action stuff but um, he's not the most versatile actor you're absolutely right um, understated is definitely the best way for him to play things when he tries to go over the top like in Point Break with the I am an FBI agent bit which is it's just start to laugh but um, I like the guy I really like the guy uh, and I think he was great in um, in, in John Wick and um, as Ed said, he's aged really well. And, uh, you know, if he was to do a, um, a Bill and Ted reunion, I think I'd be up for that. He's also well, had a fairly tragic personal life. Only Kelsey yes. Grammer has a more tragic personal well, life. What happened story. to Kelsey Grammer? Uh, well, pretty much everyone that Kelsey Grammer has ever loved or been related to has died. And I'm I'm not overstating that for dramatic effect. This is not time to talk about Kelsey Grammer. He's merely, a, a, if you like, a, the benchmark of tragedy. Keanu Reeves what, comes uncomfortably um, close. No, genuine. Kelsey Grammer's like the, the guy in the Skittles advert. Everything it, he touches. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Wait, about- Nonetheless, Keanu Reeves, has, you, you're absolutely right. He's had it, uh, you know, life has not been kind outside of film to Keanu Reeves. Um, and... 
it does seem if it, and the other thing is obviously then if you there's this whole sort of internet meme thing about you you, you occasionally just spot him behaving in a way that's quite unusually normal for for someone who's been involved in Hollywood for for God knows how long you know he if and when he's in New York he only moves around by subway um presumably it, when there is actually the subway to do that i'm not suggesting he digs tunnels in the ground to where he needs to go <laughs> although that one itself would be seriously cool um, around a giant sandwich <laughs> uh, and as you say donates a lot of money to charity and um you know uh, a big fan of building custom motorcycles i mean obviously that's a bit camp but you know that's uh it's all by the by so yeah so it, it, it as i say it's not outside of film he's sort of balanced balanced a lot of unfortunate things with being sort of an all-round sort of top bloke i think i think what we're coming to at this point is that we all kind of like keanu reeve movies unless somebody wants to say otherwise let's be clear there are some keanu reeves movies <laughs> i would be quite glad never to ever watch again i i i would quite happily bill him at my standard hourly rate for the time <laughs> i lost watching the 47 roman <laughs> um I, I guess one thing uh, one thing that he has done that that did express the selfishness of the guy is um, the one he did about the filmmakers, and I can't remember what it's called now, Steve. Side by side. Side by side. side, by side. Oh, that was good. Um, where they were talking about yeah. digital film against you know uh, normal film and all the rest of it. And the thing that struck me about that was that he didn't go into that as Keanu Reeves. So at no time was he you know putting himself out as I am Keanu Reeves and I am interviewing so and so. He let everybody else talk, and he was in the background. Now he was making a documentary, but he let everybody else express what they wanted to express and he was his questioning was was spot on he, ne- he never mentioned that he was in the film industry unless the person he was interviewing mentioned it which i thought was really uh, again another good side of the guy you know it wasn't his, even though it was his project it wasn't his project he just came across as a, as a film a genuine film lumber didn't yeah he, totally yeah it was an excellent documentary i'd forgotten about it so, added to the AV Forum's clothing list will be our Keanu Reeves fan club t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, uh, that is all we've got time for this week. So, um, my thanks to Steve Weathers. If I'd known then what I know now, I would have called a cab. Mark Hodgkinson. Come on, Johnson, use both shoes. Mark Botwright. He pushed me over. And it's Ellie. If I feel so much as one bullet hit me, I'll come over there and pull your lungs out through your nostrils. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmarkavforums.com for latest reviews, news and video. And you can also leave us a rating on iTunes, but only if it's five stars. I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll see you again next Wednesday. (laughs) 